morning, everyone. This presentation will be on energy economics. We are very fortunate to have Dr. Eric uh, Lilford. Uh, Dr. Eric Lilford is uh, an engineer and a um, minerals and energy economics uh, economist. He heads the minerals and energy economics discipline and master program master's program at Cardiff University. He is also a chair of Clean Energy Storage Solutions Company and a director of Clean Energy Focused uh, Minerals Companies with copper and other mineral assets located in uh, Botswana and Namibia in Africa. So his research focuses on economic interpretation of rules and regulations governing the global resources the sector as well as the economics surrounding the mineral industry, the minerals industry, including those minerals and value chains associated with clean energy and energy transition. I warmly welcome Dr. Eric. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so my focus areas, as Professor said, is anything and everything to do with minerals, energy economics, which also goes into things like ESG, the S part of ESG, how you qualify, quantify ESG parameters and component parts. With a background in engineering, um, as well as in uh, economics, energy economics, minerals economics, um, and investment banking, you try and bring it all together to try and get a, an overall feel for how these interplays work with each other. So the typical minerals energy economics areas that, uh, that sort of get me out of bed in the morning, other than the, the regular economics, which you're all at fay with in any event, are things like, you know, your commodities and currency supply demand, where we're going to get the next ton of um, cobalt from if it's not from the DRC or lithium, when we know energy efficiencies and batteries is only about 34%, and all these wonderful things, which we'll touch on briefly, but there's a huge world of economics that that typically the man in the street, the woman in the street, the person in the street, uh, does not necessarily get exposed to. So hopefully I can bring some interesting stuff to light during the course of, of the seminar. The way I present seminars, I'm absolutely comfortable. If you interject, call me out. Liar, quite happy with it. <laughs> not a problem at all. Um, I'm happy to take you on. I'm happy to be proven wrong. I'm also just human. So I quite enjoy the interaction, but if there's no questions during the course of the presenting, that's equally fine. I'm just going to keep on moving. So you need to speak up and, and interject because I don't slow down. So commodities, currencies, asset operation valuations for producing and unproducing assets. We all know that for producing assets, and I'm talking about anything, whether it's an agricultural field or whether it's uh, some biodiversity, you have certain things that can readily be valued. Other stuff can't. What about opportunity loss, opportunity cost? You don't have a purpose just yet for a, a, a certain piece of ground, a piece of land. Well, what is the value of that? It's none producing. What could you do? So you look at optimization, you look at opportunities. So those things really interest me as well. Um, approaches, methodology, once the methodologies comes into that kind of paradigm, where not everything is, is valued or, or evaluated on the basis of a cash flow analysis. It could be on the basis of a derivative instrument, and that's fun stuff. So we will try not to get into too much of the mass of that. Um, interpretation of policy and regulation. So when a government says, are we going to change a royalty regime or a taxation regime? Well, that's all fine and well, especially in emerging markets. We want to capture and add valorum royalty. That's wonderful. Then you look at the economic interpretation of what does it actually do to, say, like a mineral deposit or an energy system, and you realize that there's certain factors that are not taken into account with the overall implication or, or application of an ad valorem or unit-based royalty, as opposed to something like a resource rent a policy or a, um, a profit-based royalty. Very, very different versions of the same thing with different uh, consequences. Um, LCREs. So I'll touch on LCREs today, levelized costs. LCs, levelized costs, absolutely important parameter because an LCOE, levelized cost of energy, looks at the entire life cycle of an energy system. So it looks at the capital expenditure up front, the ramp up costs going, getting up to a certain point, the life of operation of an energy system, um, what it costs operations maintenance, any additional capital expansion, expansion uh, expenditures on that contributions to rehabilitation and then your final closure and cleanup at the end. And all of that gets brought back into a single number. It's an LCOE. 
But what it does do at the same time, it recognizes the fact that certain energy systems like nuclear power stations have a life or longevity of in excess of 60, 75 years, versus something like a wind farm, which might only be 15 years. So it factors out all of that in. And the problem I've got with some of that is the discount rate. We'll touch on that briefly as well. Economics of ESG and energy transition. And today, it's largely around this bottom one, energy transition. So I'm going to look at the global drive towards clean energy, energy transition, but it's a transition. It's not a permanent solution. You'll understand why by the time I'm finished. What are the energy metals and minerals that we are needed, that are needed by the planet to get into this um, whole new paradigm of energy transition? As I say, there's no permanence about it. The LCs, sustainability, conclusion. I put Q&A at the end, but as I say, please interject and go wild. You'll be happy to know that my slides don't look like this all the time because one thing I do not do typically is put a whole bunch of words and numbers and expect you to then read it, understand it, because what happens is then you lose track of what I'm saying rather than uh, or you, your preferential start looking at the table and saying, well, what is that saying? What does that mean? Etc. All I've done here before I get into the guts of it, I've just given you an idea of what are your comparators in terms of energy content for what, from whatever source. And what are your carbon footprints? Because the biggest issue around where we're moving in energy transition is to move away from fossil-based or, or carbon-based fuels. That's the whole drive. So the question then comes up, well, is man responsible for climate change or has nature, geology, in these cycles of 50 to 70,000 years, we were going to head for higher levels of CO2 in the atmosphere in any event? Well, there's room to be said that we're possibly speeding up the cycle and it's through using these fossil fuels that we don't assist um, the cause of getting to that um, shortened cycle of, of climate change. So climates always change. They have for time immemorial. We're just shortening the period at which these events actually transpire, and they're quite devastating, as you have seen. So your typical high carbon content um, sources of fuel that we love to you know, switch your lights on, and guess where most of our um, power comes from here in WA, it's not safe too much because it tends to be rather filthy. Through to diesel, petrol, crude oil, energy, LPG. What you do have moving towards a sustainable, clean economy from an energy point of view is things like hydrogen. There's a swear word because a lot of people don't like uranium. I'll tell you right now, pull your head out of the sand because uranium can offer a good solution. When you see with the levelized cost, you'll understand what I'm talking about. We know how to deal with um, the parameters associated with um, nuclear waste, uranium-235 isotopes, which are actually radioactive. We can bury them in salt caverns. I can tell you right now, as Tafes said, that I'm on the board of a, a company that is looking at um, energy storage solutions, which is hydrogen. But you can use the same salt diapers for storage of things like um, expended or expensed fuel rods. So depleted rods, they're not totally depleted. Um, they still sit with about 0.8 to 1% um, uranium-235, so they're still radioactive, but you can bury them in salt layers, and that, there is no external influence, none whatsoever. We know in the U.S. they bury um, spent fuel rods in uh, the Ural Mountains. Well, I'm sure that mountain glows in the dark by now. But when you look at the energy content, uranium um, sits at somewhere around 575,000 megajoules per kilogram, of energy content. Compare that with hydrogen, 131 megajoules a kilogram, which is significantly higher than everything else, even LPG, LNG, at only 48 megajoules a kilogram. So it tells you that hydrogen has got a great energy content. Converting that energy into useful energy, electricity, or um, a, a driving force, kinetic energy, there's still a bit of a challenge associated with that. But in the same way that maybe 150 years ago, petrol, we didn't have cars, let alone petrol going into cars, it was highly inefficient. Well, nowadays, everyone has a petrol car or a diesel car. The same thing with time and effort and research, we will improve these systems. So that was just to give you a, a, a taste of the background. What I'm looking at, focusing on, are these two key areas here on energy transition, which are pretty much under the storage line of electric vehicles, have a touch on that. And then for sustainable, what we're looking at in terms of renewable. Okay. Looking at this move towards the transition energy, we are trying to drive the world to and understand this disparity between emerging markets and countries that already have created the necessary pollution in order to get to where we are. Okay, there's not a way to, to frame it. When you have a look at a conventional car, it has huge amounts of copper and um, manganese built into your typical combustion engine. 
right, that's beautiful. We want to convert or transition to an electric car. Well, have a look what we need in terms of electric vehicles. We need a whole bunch more copper, if there's such a thing as a bunch more. We need many more tons of copper. We need lithium, which we didn't need previously. Nickel, manganese, we still need. We need cobalt, we need graphite, huge amounts of graphite, anodes and cathodes, so they're sitting in your batteries. So there's a, there's a whole ream of, of reasons why this isn't sustainable, not only from the fact that your energy density of a lithium ion battery is only about 32, 33%, and we can only, physically only let you get to about 40%, no more than 40%, so they're always gonna be inefficient. No matter how you develop technology, physics says it can't get it any better. When you look then at how we recharge an EV, and hopefully some of you are having a little smile on your face to see in the corner there, that's probably not ideal on how you recharge an EV, but typically we want to have a clean source of energy. So what do we need in terms of the metals on the clean sources of energy? We need huge amounts of copper for offshore. Why? Because you've got to look at your transmission lines. There aren't transmission lines going into the ocean, so offshore is going to use huge amounts of all of these things, including um, zinc, because of the... Um, the salt in the air causing rust oxidation, pretty much. So onshore wind, lesser amounts, but still huge amounts of metal. Solar PV, nuclear, needs a fair amount of a lot of things, including rare earth. Coal, not so much. So you know what? And, and I'll tell you right now, coal is with us from an energy source, probably for the next, I would say, readily 30 to 50 years. So I don't think it's going anywhere in a hurry. Um, and natural gas. So just some of the metals that you, you actually require. This is your intensity of it. You, you can have a copy of these slides because I'm not going to go through every single piece, but literally what you're looking at is from a 2020 point of view to 2030 to 2050, what is the demand for each of these metals going forward in order to just for renewable energy? Okay, so solar PV, well, we need five tons of copper for every megawatt we generate. We need four and a half tons of copper for onshore, and we need 9.6 tons of copper for offshore. Gives you an idea of, of how much material, how much more mineral we actually need. So I pose the question to you, where the hell do you think this comes from? Where are you gonna get more copper? That's just a, a table saying the same kind of thing with a few more metals in there. We know that all your big porphyry copper deposits, the likes of in um, Chile, which is your Escondida, El Teniente, um, Chuquicamata, El Abra, all of those operations, Operate on porphyries. Those porphyries are low grade. They're typically between 0.2 and 0.4% copper. So they're earth moving exercises. Sorry, earth moving exercises. They are barely mining operations. They are moving mountains in order to get a little bit of copper out. When I say a little bit, sure, they're producing over 600,000 tons, a million tons. So it's huge volumes. But how much earth do they have to move to get that um, low grade material out? And it's going to get worse. When I say worse, I'm talking about even lower grade still as long as your copper price supports it from an economics point of view, because we just don't have enough of the metal. Right, this gives you, the next two slides gives you an idea of what I'm talking about in terms of how much more do we actually need? And you might say, Eric, come on, can we get to the economics already? What economics have you spoken about so far? I'm just setting the scene, all right? So how much more lithium do we need? Currently, this is at 2022, we produce 678,000 tons contained lithium. We need 3.3 million going up to 2035. So we need 4 million tons by 2035. What does that mean? A typical mine that produces 45,000 tons of contained lithium metal as a hydroxide or as a carbonate. We need another 74 mines before 2035. Those of you who have a good understanding of the resources sector know that from an exploration phase through to production takes probably 10 years. We're 2023, this is 2035. In the next two years, we have to have found these deposits and start the studies on them and get 74 new mines up and running within the next 10 years to feed into 2035. I don't know about you, but I can tell you right now, it's not going to happen. Cobalt, typical size, 5,000. That's actually quite a big operation, 5,000 tons of contained metal. We need 62 new mines by 2035. Nickel, we need at 42,000 tons of contained metal per annum, we need another 72 mines to be started within the next three years, next two years. But when you say we need, is that Australian needs? No, this is global. So I'm talking about the globe. Okay. Yeah, so this is global, sorry. Absolutely. This is right around the world. But keep in mind, 
That is your first world economies that are driving the need on the we front because we haven't even looked at the emerging markets to say you need to go clean as well. We can't do that. So these numbers are really, really conservative if you're trying to get the world to act in a clean manner as far as energy is concerned. Graphite, another 97 mines producing 56,000 tons um, per annum. And synthetic graphite, we use a lot of synthetic graphite around. So these are obviously not mines, slightly different emblem, those, these are factories, all right? So we need, we need plenty. Just coming back to Australia specifically, you're probably aware maybe, not, that Australia has a power demand, electricity, well, it's a power demand of around about 60 to 65,000 uh, megawatts every year. So 60 gigawatts a year. So on the basis of 60 gigawatts a year, if we wanted to convert the whole of Australia to clean energy, clean renewable energy systems, we would need, and you only have about a 30 to 35% capacity factor, both for wind turbines and um, solar panels, Right? The sun doesn't shine at night and the wind doesn't always blow. So you have to have these things called overbuild and uh, curtailment a, and you need land mass. And this is what this is showing. That in the land mass, when you look typically that your standard um, wind turbine is a six megawatt turbine versus solar panels, your standard panels are 800 watt panels. To get the whole of Australia on PV solar, we'd need over 2,000 square kilometers of land to be able to, to secure that kind of power. There's a problem with that as well, as I said, the sun doesn't shine at night. So that might be great that it meets those power requirements, but it doesn't solve our problem. We need to have energy storage that goes with that. All right, and you can see I put in a little blue there, excludes storage. So you need even more land, let alone even more metal for that solution. For wind, it's even worse. You need just under 30,000 square kilometers. Because, you know, wind turbines, they create turbulence in the air that affects the next turbine, so you've got to have the space. So what you do is you have 0.9 of a square kilometer for every turbine, whereas for um, solar, you only need eight <coughs> square meters um, separation or eight square meters per panel, which includes your, your area in between, so you can actually go and clean these things and service them, etc. So that equates to about 170 by 170 um, grid, 28,000 square kilometers. To give you an idea, the whole of ACT is only 2,300 square kilometers. So you need the whole of the ACT just for solar, and you need a number of ACTs just for wind. The issue that you're going to have in any event is that we can't transmit. Australia's a huge country. So how do we get transmission? Even if we took over the whole of Canberra, or the whole of um, ACT, which I don't think we're missing other politicians, but assuming we took over the whole of the ACT and put these things in place, transmission becomes an issue. And just to give you an example here, India recently, they commissioned the, um, the Badia solar, uh, solar Park, 56 square kilometers. So their um, area density, 40 square kilometers for every megawatt. This here, wind, two square kilometers per megawatt. And our solar panels are 29 square kilometers per megawatt. So that's 40. Not sure what India has done to have almost double what uh, the stats are saying, but that's a lot of land. Okay, the fun stuff, we can actually get onto the economics now we set the scene. So th the whole term behind levelized cost, literally what you're looking at is longevity of, a, of an energy generation system, and then all of the costs that go in, the capital expenditure, the operations and maintenance, um, any expansions, uh, operating costs, any cost, including uh, closure, post-closure, monitoring, all those things. So every single cost that goes in, and then there's this horrible thing called the discount rate. Discount rates, typically we, we work on a weighted average cost of capital, which looks at the weighting of the balance between equity and debt financing. I have a problem with how this calculation is performed, but I'm uh, still doing more on it to say what would be preferred. Because when you fund these uh, developments, are you only looking at the cost of equity and cost of debt, or should it just be the cost of equity? Or should it actually be the risky rate of interest, which is a return on a government bond on a post-tax basis? Should that be your discount rate, you know, your cost of capital, which you're probably aware, you know, in your capital asset pricing model, it's that equity component. So there's still, I won't say there's debate on it, I'm about to demonstrate that there's some flaws associated with it, but, but it's one thing to point out errors it's another thing to say, well, then what you should do instead. So 
I don't want to just say, well, this is a problem without giving a, uh, an alternative. So that's what I'm working towards. Just on the capital expenditure front, before we get into the, um, the actual overall numbers, just the capex. So a natural gas peaker is costing 13.7 US cents for every kilowatt hour, all the way down to land-based wind is costing you 3 cents, 3.3 cents per kilowatt hour. So you can see there's a, there's a big range in terms of capital expenditure. But as I said, capital expenditure is only one small component part of your overall, overall levelized cost, which operating cost is typically the biggest part. And in fact, on top of that, if you're looking at coal and other consumed energy sources um, like gas, you've got uh, your fuel as a big component of cost. This is what we show here. All right, so this is modified after Lazard uh, 2022. So I've done more work on this and actually split it out into uh, what I would think is more succinct kinds of, uh, of numerics. All the way from solar rooftop residential, solar commercial industrial, solar utility, solar utility plus one, geothermal wind onshore, offshore storage, gas peaking, nuclear coal. So you can do the full comparative of where we are here. What's intriguing is that we look at the likes of nuclear and say, well, no wonder we don't want nuclear. It's so expensive on a level up cost. Basis. I hear you until I show you what's wrong with all of those solars and winds that are saying, oh, you know, we're so cheap, we can get down to 38. And these are Australian dollars now, right? Australian dollars per megawatt hour. So we can get wind right down to between 38 and 117 um, onshore, and we can get solar utility scale from 38 to about 150, almost the same kind of range. And that sounds wonderful. Gee, this is, this is great. Let's carry on pushing. Here's a bit more research and it will become sustainable over time but we still won't get the sun to shine at night. So we're still going to have an issue. That, and you'll see towards the end, I, I do say that the final solution is not any one of these in isolation. It's a combination of them. So I'm not trying to suggest that none of these works. I'm trying to suggest to you that don't look at any one in isolation and say, we're going to go clean with just solar, or we're just going to combine solar with wind and we've got a solution. We don't. What I've also done in each of these is I've, I've split out what your typical capital expenditure and operating cost component is because that's an important part of LCOEs, of your levelized cost of energy. And then for a lot of these, you know, solar, well, we don't pay for sunlight, so there's no fuel cost. But of course, when you go to coal, you have got a, a fuel cost, you know, 16% of the cost, the levelized cost sits in fuel. You also have variable costs, you've got fixed costs, and you've got capital expenditure. So that's how you read this. And again, you get a copy of these and you can have a look at this in greater detail. Before I get on to the one that then shows you the reality of where we are. So that's somewhat theoretical, but it, it, it is reality, but it doesn't take into account all the facets that are associated with the various cost components associated with these clean energy systems and the move towards sustainable clean energy. The trend lines are looking good. So beautiful solar PV crystalline has come right down from years gone by. It was one of the most expensive back in 2009, the end of 2020, 21, it's one of the cheapest. Hey, brilliant. We're on the right track. We haven't got there yet. We're on the right track. So your learning curve is absolutely wonderful. You'll see that there's not much more learning to be done as far as nuclear or gas peaker or solar thermal. All of those stay relatively flat um, over there, but there is still room for further improvement um, on some of the others, on some of the other renewables. I mentioned to you that I got a problem with these discount rates because the discount rates, as I said, is um, typically defined from your um, weighted average cost of capital, which is, as I said, the weighting of debt and equity. It actually should be the weighting of your debt, equity, and prep shares. We don't have prep shares, prep shares in Australia, so let's ignore those for now. But what ultimately transpires is when you have a look at the impact of a discount rate on the mass behind an LCO, where you start saying, well, gee, this is quite an important factor. We can't ignore discount rate. We can't just look at the capex and the opex and the operations and maintenance mm -hmm. and exposure costs. You have to give the same kind of attention to a discount rate. The same can be said for when you're doing a feasibility study on anything. What will happen is you spend two years, three years defining a definitive study. You've employed consultants. A definitive study might cost $20 million for whatever, a plant, an operation, an agricultural setting, a farm, a, a commercial ammonia plant for fertilizer, whatever it is. You've spent millions of dollars in defining all your technical and techno-economic and economic inputs. And then somebody says, hmm, Let's use an 8% discount rate. And that takes five seconds to do that, and you've got an error. 
You've got a problem. Well, when I say you've got an error, you've got a, a furphy. It's a problem because you haven't actually defined what that um, what the discount rate is, and it's a hugely important component within the world of economics, and in fact, just in in strategy. So where do you have three discount numbers now? One set of numbers. Right. So you got uh, this is just trying to demonstrate to you a potential return, and again, I don't agree with the the returns that I've calculated on the basis that you've got a cost of equity and cost of debt. So cost of equity is always above your cost of, of debt. Why? Partly because you can never fully eliminate and diversify away from something like sovereign risk, which is part of your capital asset pricing model, which then goes into dictating the lowest discount rate you could apply to a utility that is funded by government. So government's got risk. So you, you're always going to be sitting at at least the post-tax risk-free rate. So the three numbers there, what these don't show is what the weighting is. So the two critical ones that you're looking at is this. This is a return. So these two, equity and debt, what percent is 12 What percent is 8%? In other words, what is your debt to capital and equity to capital weightings on these costs of funding? And no one will tell you. So that's another reason why we've got a problem. So the figures are based on weighted average. Correct, on a weighted average, and no one tells you what the weighting is. What percent is equity and what percent is debt? That's why it's weighting. And yet, it is a weighting, and your sources remain silent on it. Again, it's another reason I can get these numbers to tell you any story you want. So, what, what do analysis mostly use? Um, what do use? Comparatives. So, what we've done is we've just said all of these sources, nuclear, gas, they can all source the same equity and the same debt at the same cost, and they have the same weighting. It makes it comparative. But what you should probably be doing is saying, well, the, the uh, um, equity cost of, okay, let's ignore the equity because equity is equity. Your debt cost for nuclear is different to the debt cost of combined cycle or debt cost of coal. So we should actually be matching the 12% equity right across the board, but different debt um, costs dependent upon your, your actual uh, um, solution, your energy producing solution. So that they, this is is incorrect. So you generated these numbers? These ones are taken um, after Lazard, so I took them and I modified them, but I did not put differentials in. Okay, so this is, a, this is a existing sources that have used particular weights yeah. rather than you run a particular set of assumptions yeah. across everything. Correct, yes. Okay. Right. Yeah. And Lazards are, are fairly well known for the research that they put out. And uh, for any one individual to go and suggest and denounce everything they've done would be taking on a behemoth. And I need to make sure I've got all my um, information at my fingertips before I do that. But it's coming. Sorry. Yes. So, see, I mean, something like nuclear is often funded by the government. So Correct. Which discount rate should you? Use? You should look closer to your sovereign risk rate, which is the return on a government bond. Because they are sourcing their fund. The government sources its funding through Treasury. Treasury supports or secures funding through the IMF. The IMF lends to various um, economies or the World Bank through various economies at the sovereign risk rate. That's the return they get. So you're looking at the post-tax uh, cost of equity, which effectively is just the sovereign, rate, uh, sovereign risk. Because remember, your capital asset pricing model is your um, RM plus your factors on beta. Well, you don't have a beta for government. There is no beta multiplied by your um, your actual market risk premium. But there is no market risk premium here either because it's government. So that drops away and all you're left with is your risk free rate. And the risk free rate is a return on a government bond. Make sure it's post tax. So should all these be compared on, the, you know, on that basis? No. And the reason is because nuclear may be funded by government. I can tell you right now, most of the others are not. Now, wind is commercial. So when then you have to say, well, this goes beyond government because what will happen is Treasury will then lend out to your commercial banks and commercial banks will provide the loans for the others to develop their private practice. So no, but if the, your, your question is very fair, if the government supported and funded and had a parastatal that delivered a, a wind farm, then yes, absolutely, then you'd use the same sovereign risk rate for that. So you're doing a policy comparison, you use the same discount rate, but if, if you were to what, what the private uh, company would actually take as their incentive, uh, it would be these 
discount rates. Correct. Now be, be careful on incentive because incentive includes a hurdle rate. I'm not talking about a hurdle rate yet. All I'm talking about is the cost, the cost of funding, the cost of equity, and the cost of debt. If you want to, if you say that um, commercial entity wants you to get a three percent return above its borrowing rate for equity and debt, then you add, you will add three percent to your WAC to your weighted average cost of capital. Then you get a, a WAC plus a factor, which then gives you your return. Okay. I don't think there is a specific reason. I think if I had to guess why they don't release, and you go through the entire report. So these reports are available if you go into the into the website. And the 2020, there is a 2022 report in there. Uh, they didn't have the layout the same way. Um, even then, they don't tell you what the weighting is because they don't spend much time on the discount rate. They're more concerned about trying to get your full capital cost and your full O and M and your full closure and fuel costs, etc. So no, they don't they don't divulge what the weighting is, which is a most unfortunate and I think a little bit of a a little bit of mischief. You should because it's such an important part. How strong an assumption is it to to be telling stories like um, uh, this in terms of global costs and so on uh, when things vary a lot between countries? It will not in risk varies significantly one country the, the to the cost, next. The cost, for example, if you are thinking of uh, offshore wind or the capex, yeah, in different countries, yeah. cost of things are quite different. They will be different. And we'll get to a point now, coming up, I think it's possibly even the next slide, that then starts factoring in things like what you're talking about. What are the things that are not said in these calculations? So these calculations will apply typically to first all countries that are, you have similar parameters around you know, what are the cost offshore versus onshore and your policies are fairly similar and they're stable and you have low sovereign risk and it's, those are all the same. But if you wanted to go into Gabon and go into the Atlantic Ocean um, offshore and then put a wind farm up there, can you use these numbers? And I'll tell you right now, no, definitely, of course you're not, because you've got things like mobilization costs, you've got import um, duties on equipment. So you bring all of this, you know, uh, $100 million worth of equipment in, including your blades and and there's an import duty on it. This doesn't factor in anything. That's a component part of cost, but there's nothing like import duty in there. There's um, withholding taxes. So your wind farm, your, your uh, the government won't fund it, I can tell you right now in Gabon, they definitely won't fund it, so it's private, but they've got a withholding tax. So you've got an additional tax on distributable income if you're trying to divvy it out of the country. There's another 10% you take off. So those costs, if you need, if you want to run the exercise for a specific country, you take the specifics of that country into account. So this is, I, I like your point. This is generic, and it's generic for first world countries. Yes. Okay. okay. How many discounted cash flows have you done in the past? Uh, not many. Not many. <laughs> That's a fair answer, because otherwise I was going to say you need to go back to lectures and listen. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's because your capital expenditure is front loaded. What does it cost to produce about a 3,600 megawatt nuclear power plant? It's between 18 and 20 billion dollars. That money is spent up front. When you start discounting over time, what numbers get discounted the most? Because discounting is compounding. It's a compounding discount. So your 18 billion stays as a negative right up front, but all your benefits later on are being discounted by time and a compounding factor. Hence, Capital expenditure is your big one for nuclear. It's the most expensive per megawatt hour. Okay. The trend lines look promising. So that's why I said I'm not here to denounce and suggest to you that we can't move towards um, these are sustainable sources of, of clean energy, but we have to mix them. So you can just see as an example, I've put some fossil fuel levelized cost and there's just the operating cost component, and you throw the capex and all the other bits and pieces, including closure, and that's what you get. And you can see where your renewables, that's wind and solar largely, how we've improved over time, including with um, battery. Again, 2010, you include storage, huge cost. Where are we going? Well, we still haven't, we, we're not better than coal yet, and you'll see in the next graph, we're not quite there yet, and we'll get there. So I'm comfortable with where we're going, 
But people who say right now, today, that um, solar power and wind power are cheaper than coal, I tell them you've been smoking your socks and you need to share it around. Um, before we get to that, that one all-encompassing graph, uh, your energy sustainability as far as carbon is concerned. So when you look, it's pretty much from a life cycle. You can't do a levelized cost on carbon production because there's there's no inflow versus outflow. There's just an outflow. It's an outflow of CO2. Yes, there's a cost. And if you put a carbon cost on, I could do an LCO. We, Australia should have had a carbon cost. We did. We don't. Politics got involved. So we still don't. But you can see coal generates somewhere around 820 grams of carbon dioxide per kilowatt hour. I say equivalent because the equivalent sits with things like sulfur, which converts to sulfur dioxide. Sulfur dioxide, as you all know, will produce acid rain H2SO4 up in the atmosphere and not so good. It's also got particulates, so we convert that to an equivalent. Coal, the dirtiest biomass, and so we go until you get to nuclear or hydropower, very clean, but you'd say, well, hang on, hydropower, nuclear, and these clean sources, wind, why is there any CO2? Well, the CO2 is in your construction phase, cement. You look at the breakdown of, of limestone to produce cement, the generation of CO2 is unbelievable through the kiln. So that's factored into a lifetime, a life cycle. So effectively, it's, it's a levelized cost without a discount rate. We can solve the CO2 problem, but there's a cost. So this is now a levelized cost of sorting out CO2. Very quickly, direct air capture. I think we're sitting at somewhere around 417 parts per million in our current atmosphere, somewhere around there. So direct air capture is literally, let's put a plant up outside. It's not near a source, in other words. And let's just capture the CO2 in the air. And that's, that's what it will cost you between 229 and 530 Aussie dollars per tonne to capture that. Well, it's only economics, no one's going to do it commercially. So typically what you want to do is you want to bring your capture, your uh, carbon capture unit, closer to the source of most of that carbon. Ideally, if we can put one over a volcano and that kind of thing, you can capture a lot of that because we can't control the CO2 emitted from a volcano. And believe me, that produces a lot more CO2. Any one eruption, just you know, five days in outside Bali will produce far more than, than most of the world's power stations will over an entire year. Anyway, we don't capture that. That goes um, into the atmosphere. But you can see that, you know, all the way coal to chemicals, that's like um, chemical fuels, uh, coal, that, that's the fischer tropsch uh, process, if you recall from your days of chemistry. We can capture at a cost the CO2. This is not factored into um, your levelized costs, which it should actually, should be factored in. Because right now what we're assuming on the levelized cost is that we just let the CO2 disappear. Why? Because we don't have a, a, a cost of carbon. So because there's no cost of carbon, I don't have to look, to look at a cost of sequestration. So again, we're really sitting with impure numbers. Here's an interesting little, I just threw this in because it's a talking point over a beer or otherwise a glass of wine. Um, at $100 per ton, we can convert CO2 into carbon flakes. That's a great thing. Can't get it, $100 a ton is not commercial at this stage, because to do it is going to cost a lot more. Uh, uh, the, the revenues, the benefits we get are nowhere near $100 a ton. I mean, if we can sequester at $30 a ton, why the hell do I want to convert it at $100 a ton? I, I just, I can't get a return. But if we can improve this um, gallium or other uh, technique, we need more graphite. So this is what this is doing. It's we're converting it to carbon flakes. Well, what are carbon flakes? Well, that's graphite. And we're using graphite in our anodes, in electric uh, um, vehicles, in our in our batteries. And we use them in, uh, we saw in uh, the uh, wind farms. And we use them all over the, we use graphite everywhere. One of the problems with graphite and wind farms, of course, is the, the carbon used in the blades is chemically complex. And the issue that we currently have is that we can't reprocess. So levelized cost should also factor in the ability to reprocess and reuse existing materials that go into that particular um, unit, like a generating unit in a coal plant. We can do that for coal. We can't do it for our, um, our interface on our photon release in solar PVs. And we can't do it with our turbine blades. The, the chemical, the chemistry behind getting those blades to what they are 
totally anti-corrosion, can withstand over modulus of elasticity, they can bend in the wind because, you know, these blades are 120 meters long and possibly even longer. So what do we do after a typical 10-year life? They don't last forever. We bury them. So that cost there is not sitting in, in uh, LCOE, and that's part of what I'm working on now, amongst all the other stuff I'm busy doing, is to determine how do you factor in a, a cost of, of just burying your problem. So this is the one I want to do really get into. So when you start looking at this from a realistic point of view, what are we talking about? We have the total levelized cost on a sustainable basis. Now, sustainability means that when the sun doesn't shine, I can still draw power. When the wind doesn't blow, I can still draw power. So what you see here, if you ignore from the yellow upwards, you can see that wind and solar are significantly cheaper very close to natural gas, um, close to a uh, closed circuit. And that's a closed circuit with a turbine. So very, very similar and becoming cheaper and cheaper. But, and the but is, they're all private. So you've got a utility profit. It's never factored into an LCOE. What about a land tax? I gave you some idea of how much land you need. What about the land tax? What's well, part of the and you pay land rates every single year if you've got a wind farm or a solar array. So there's a land tax. What about transmission? We know that wind transmission, certainly offshore, you need quite a bit. So there's a little bit in transmission. What about load balance? What is load balance? Oh, well, as I said, when the sun doesn't shine and the wind doesn't blow, you need load balance. So that's a storage system. It doesn't have to be battery. You could do something like um, salt thermal storage. You could do... Uh, pumped hydro storage. There's other ways of storing, but at the end of the day, you've still got a significant cost associated with when the sun doesn't shine or when the wind doesn't blow. And the last one, which are big numbers, overbuild and curtailment. Because remember what I showed you, that in the LCOE for um, solar and for wind, I said that this country needs around about 60 gigawatts a year. And yet I had a factor of three times because your energy density or capacity or efficiency is only 30 percent so you need this overbuild these numbers here are assuming that during the daytime the sun always shines and during windy period the wind always blows they don't take this overbuild and curtailment what also happens is what it doesn't take into account is that on a very tidy day so what is your um, solar generation your power generation today it's very cloudy the clouds are fairly thick what penetration are you getting from light? Because remember, this is not about heat, all right? Your photons are released on light. So it's not that light at the moment. So what kind of release rate of photons do you get in, in solar? Well, not as, it's certainly not 100%. And what then happens is, okay, well, I need to build two to three times the number of, of these solar units in order to guarantee that on the cloudy days, which happens all the way through our winters, that at least I can provide what these things are rated to provide. But then when it is summer, I now have excess supply. What do I do with it? I curtail. I, I literally shut them out of the grid. They're still generating and I can't use it. So that's, this is the reality. The positive news, folks, I'm not telling you this doesn't work. The positive news is we're improving on all of this. We're improving on this. And the biggest thing that we're improving on is energy storage. And there's a lot of economics around energy storage. I mean, I'd be saying that if you've got this overbuilt and excess capacity, what you could be doing is electrolyzing water. We know that the electrolyzation of water is one of the most expensive forms of getting hydrogen out of water, right? But if you've got this overbuilt, you've got this excess capacity, you can use the excess to generate hydrogen through an electrolyzer. And then in the same salt caverns I was talking about earlier for sequestering um, spent fuel rods, you can actually use hydrogen storage caverns also in the salt diapers, which are big salt domes, all right? You just drill them out, you, you solution mine, you create these nice oval shapes, you bury your hydrogen, and then on demand, you can suck the hydrogen out. And the beauty of, of salt, sodium chloride, it remains plastic. As long as you don't include any moisture, it's got to be dry. It remains plastic under pressure. So you could fill up a hydrogen ca uh, cavern or a cavern with hydrogen, pump it up to a certain pressure, and then you can release approximately 70% of that hydrogen. What for? Oh, to generate uh, through a generator, general electricity. You do that at night. So you can have an overbuild, wind farm, solar farm, whatever. When you've got excess, electrolyze, use the hydrogen when you need it. Possibility, I'm not saying that I've got all the answers. 
mindful of time. I've got a few more slides which just show you um, a little bit away from um, the pure LCOE kind of stuff we've been talking about. To get energy out, you need to put energy in. This is just a, a rough table. It is really rough because I did some calculations and that's why there's a range in this. And what the, the bad stuff is associated with it. But, you know, coal, for every one unit of energy I put in, I can get 50 to 80 units, 50 to 80 units of energy out. So it still remains highly attractive from a energy efficiency point of view, energy in versus energy out, and also from a cost point of view. Nuclear, you would think it would be much higher, but it actually isn't. Because bear in mind that your fuel rods are only down to about 35 to 5% uranium-235 isotope. You take it higher, much more, to beyond that, and you start having um, your proliferation and your United Nations start looking at you very closely because it's considered anything above 20% as weapons grade. We know that you can't create a weapon at 20%, um, 235. Your weapons start coming into play at about 80%, 235. But if you can do 20%, believe me, either with cascades or with ASP, aerodynamic separation process, you can get that um, concentration of, of your isotope 235 significantly higher. So that's always the fear. To do 3 to 5%, not a problem. No one's too concerned about it. So just, again, for your consumption um, and interest. Very briefly, so we, we're shifting tax slightly. With this whole clean energy transition, we move to ESG. So you folks definitely have, have a good handle on the whole idea of ESG, environmental social governance, notably the social side of it. What are the economics of ESG? It's a tough one because we, we can't, some of the things in, in the S in ESG, we can't quantify. The E environmental, we know we've got environmental regulations, you can and can't do certain things. So it's largely regulated, the policies, there's procedures, protocols, that's in place. The same thing with G, the governance. Governance is, is less to do about um, regulation than it is about around ethics and principles and making sure that you're doing the right thing. So it's the overall intent, so that's part of your governance. But the S part, I was talking earlier to Tafis to say that you know, the, um, the value of King's Park to me is it's a nice open space that I can go and enjoy with my family and, and relax. But to you, it might be, this should be used for agriculture because yeah. I have an interest or whatever. So the value to me is very different to, to the value to you or to anyone else. Someone might say, well, hang on, there's a nice mound there and there's magnetite. We should go and mine it. Good luck mining King's Park. But you hear what I'm saying? So the whole the Yukon Gorge, value to someone. Now we come with a problem, and the problem is that what was the value of the 45,000-year-old cave to you? Zero? Really? It's got no value to you. Oh, but because you're a compassionate person, you're thinking, no, it does, I, I care. But to Rio Tinto, it was maybe $10,000 worth of iron ore sitting there. That's the value to Rio Tinto. And I'm not saying they, were, they didn't care about the social side of it. But to the, the nation, to the, um, the grouping, the First Nations people who had that as a heritage site said, but it's worth a lot more. So then I say to you, okay, well, if I put a billion dollars on the table, will that satisfy you? No. A trillion dollars? No. A hundred trillion dollars? I could have a many zeros. And the answer is no. We can't value the cultural significance to one group over another. That's part of the problem we have with this. That introduces this. Now, this is what's taking up quite a bit of my time at the moment. So, and it's notably down here. You heard um, Donald Rumsfeld during the um, the war back in 2000. And, yeah, there's a good nodding of a head over there, and he introduced the whole idea of the known knowns, known unknowns, the unknown knowns, uh, uh, known unknowns. I've linked them to risk and uncertainty. A risk is known, and uncertainty is unknown. Tangible is known, untangible intangible, sorry, intangible is unknown. And within a lot of work that we do, agricultural, environmental, mining, energy, we have, a, we have a fair amount of this, intangible uncertainty, an unknown unknown. And I put definitions in here, and the paper I wrote with some colleagues uh, is available if you want to do, read it again, you can, you can Google that and, and have a look for yourself. It raises a whole host of challenges. How do you qualify and then quantify intangible uncertainty. And that's the stuff that sort of gets me out of bed in the morning and probably puts me back to sleep um, by two hours in the office. 
But trying to work out and using derivative instruments to, to solve these problems, because then it's taken out of the hands of the person or the group that's trying to value something like a, um, an unknown unknown. Okay. Right. Um, just to, I wanted to leave a few minutes for questions, answers. A few other points on greenhouse gases. There's some facts on the side that water vapor is a problem. So when you're excited, or not excited, but when you're having a look up in the sky and you see this beautiful vapor trail behind an airplane, say, wow, that looks good. Please don't say that. The damage it's doing is even worse than CO2 because it's sitting that high up that your water vapor causes a bigger greenhouse gas effect than the CO2 itself. Yeah, just a bit of useless information. Interestingly here, we love CO4, right? We're using LNG, liquefied natural gas, Liquefied natural gas is methane. Methane is CH4. When you burn it, per unit of energy, it generates less CO2 than burning coal. Beautiful. That's wonderful. The problem is a lot of gas escapes and it's not burnt. When it doesn't burn, it's between 25 and 27 times worse than when it's burnt as CO2 to give off CO2. So the residence time for CH4, it's only about 10 years. So if we stop CH4 altogether, methane, 10 years and the atmosphere is cleaned up. Whereas CO2 takes between 300 and 1,000 years to disappear. Okay, and then uh, I've got hydrogen there. If it escapes, hydrogen is absolutely clean when you burn it. If you don't burn it and it escapes, it's a huge problem. There's only one that we know of. There's only one naturally occurring hydrogen uh, deposit in the world. It happens to be in Mali. I'm not sure how many of you want to go into Mali and try and go and mine it. I've been to Mali many times, and I can tell you right now, it's not a place I want to go back to in a hurry. Wrapping up, the final energy solution that we're looking at would cost, by 2030, would cost the global economy $514 billion, split down into these components, battery minerals, the batteries themselves, and then the actual metals that we saw earlier that we need. So you can peruse that. And then the, my final slides to show you where we are as far as the planet's concerned. So... This is end of 2022. I'm sure some of you get the elements. They show nice graphics. I have to go and check the numbers because truthfully, I downloaded this this morning. It, this is very, very recent. So this is hot off the press. I haven't checked the numbers. So if you call me out on as a liar on this, I'm going to go back to these people and say, you're lying. Okay, so this is not me. This is someone else. Um, elements. And you can see that from a renewals point of view, end of 2022, we're only at 14% of global energy. In fact, it's global electricity, so it's not energy, it's electricity, it's a very big difference. Energy would include things like your oil, um, would include whatever your other sources of, of energy are, um, kinetic, kinetic systems or potential systems. So this is just electricity. Okay, folks, what I've got just in the last few, I put a bunch of, this is pub talk, right? There's some, I hope you find some of these things interesting. Have a look at the slides um, and go through this because you might pick up on something here and say, shit, I want to talk about that because you can open a can of worms, you might get punched in the teeth or whatever. There's more, and guess what? There's even more. So it's cheap as you're going to go for a hell of a long drinking session or maybe split. It gives you a good reason to go to the pub a few times. Okay. And that's my last slide. So there's no individual root renewable solution that is sustainable in isolation, right? We have to mix them all together. L-series are biased to whatever story you want to tell. I can get, make those numbers tell the story that I want to tell. You can do the same thing. When energy transition phase, please note it's transition. So what does permanence look like? <clears throat> Thanks for your attention. I open it up to, uh, to any additional q and Okay, thank you. Um, Thank you very much for the talk. Very interesting and yeah. challenging as well. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, now, let me see. I'm just trying to find my... To go back here. to where you were. Yep. All right. So, yes. I had two, actually. Um, one was regarding the numbers, the energy uh, numbers that you've been showing us, uh, including the energy return on investment and all and all the other ones is they're in heat equivalents and my question is for a number of the issues that you've been mentioning wouldn't it be 
so the rather than heat equivalence would be the useful work equivalent. So in exergy terms might be a better measure. And uh, in terms that, well, studies have shown that they correlate much more closely to the amount of economic value that they produce. So that's one. And yep. the other yep. one, uh, maybe I'll, I'll let you answer that one first. No, that's a very fair point. So when you look at it from an energy content point of view, absolutely, that is usable energy, that is generatable energy, but it's not necessarily on um, what you're referring to as an overall uh, factor associated with what the benefit is. So you can rerun the numbers, but what will happen is you'll get a, a fairly similar trend as far as the as the outcomes are concerned. So one of the issues we we face is that we talk about the pure academics of it, which is one thing that you and I and, and others in the room will look at. But we need to be able to sell a story to consumers out there to impress upon them that we need to go clean, we need to do things. And if we start talking about uh, aspects that I understand, we're going to be lost forever. That's why even things like an LCOE on a per unit energy basis, energy output basis, is a way to go because a lot of practitioners have got to pay electricity in terms of kilowatt hours or they whatever. So they understand the nomenclature. We introduce new, new nomenclature. It's much like nuclear power. When you don't understand something, the first thing you're going to say is, oh, I don't believe it. I, I, don't, I don't go there. I don't want nuclear power. It's got nothing to do with the realization of what nuclear power um, is and what it's about and the goodness of it. It's all about what I don't understand, I don't want. But I do agree with you. Oh, absolutely. The numbers should... And possibly, uh, you know, if I had a few more hours, um, I would run a similar uh, graphic to demonstrate what that looks like um, on the other front. So absolutely, I agree with you. Um, the other thing is a, a question regarding um, data. W w one thing that I would have liked to know is what are the energy requirements? <clears throat> Maybe they're kind of included in the energy return on investment, but specifically the energy requirements to extract and process all these metals in order to substitute um, fossil energy, uh, fossil fuel energies by renewable energies, because I think that's part of the picture. Yeah, again, you've got two component parts. One is the life. So, what energy systems do you do you engage with for the point from the point of view of renewables? Well, the renewables, as I said, you need limestone. It's mining and processing kilns. You need the metals, so that's mining. There's a mining cost, there's a beneficiation cost, there's a fabrication cost. So you've got all of the mining costs associated with getting something like a, um, a wind farm up or a solar farm or array up. The problem that you have is that those systems only run for 10 years, maybe 15 years, and then you actually have to get rid of them and you replace them. You can't just go and re replace component parts. You literally scrub the whole up and you start again. Whereas the same costs will go or the same um, factory into determining those component parts for fossil fuels and for nuclear power and any other en energy system, you're looking at a much longer uh, tenure as far as in operations concerned. So you start playing with different tenures, which then brings the levelized cost component or um, analysis or tool into greater import. It's it's of greater importance to look at it like that rather than on something like a um, a zero NP, uh, a zero discount rate on an NPV or whatever um, metric you're going to use because you're not factoring in the the life cycle beginning to end. Thank you. Start off by saying that demand for these metals is going to explode. Presumably that's going to manifest itself in the prices of those eventually. Are those being fed into the comparative costs of these energy sources? Not at the moment. At equilibrium? I mean, just, yeah. So when you have a look at what, what does an LCOE actually mean? An LCOE means the price at which you're going to sell energy in order to cover the cost of just producing it. So that's all the LCOE is. So when you look at the... Um, the overall um, costing and the various component parts of the costing, the answer is quite simply no. You're not going to uh, consider that your commodity prices are going to reach stratospheric numbers anytime soon. 
Big Flat was, I mean, copper is sitting at about, uh, at about 360, 370 cents a pound at the moment, uh, just under $8,000 a ton. To get the amount of copper we need, that copper price would need to go to twenty, thirty thousand dollars a ton. What are the chances of that happening? You know, from an economics point of view, yeah, you know, anything's possible. If the demand is there, you need supply. But who are the investors who are going to risk mining 0.1 percent copper? That my expectation is in ten years' time, when I start selling my first metal, the price is going to be thirty thousand because at today's price, I can't make money. A couple of things are problematic. You won't get equity, and you won't get debt. You can't develop the project. So you, you, we're sitting with this, it's a dichotomy almost. It's, you're not going to get investment in new operations unless the price moves. You're not going to get the price moving unless you get the demand. You're not going to get the demand unless the people in demand are, are suggesting that they've got a source that can actually supply. So it's this whole chicken and egg. How do you get this thing up? We're not going to do it it would evolve at that point. You, you've got a paradigm shift, correct. So I'm not a paradigm shift, but just as in the system's going to evolve to the point where if really you're pushing, or the, the cap on, say, wind power will just occur because the price of the, the bid up the price of copper. The current, producing one more wind power station offshore, easy, cheap, done. Multiplying that up to 20% of Australia's can't be done on current prices. No. So, the interesting thing is, where does that sit at the equilibrium? What's the equilibrium portfolio mix? One should account for all the supply demand components. If you can, is anyone trying to look, look at that out? I think when you, you look at where your margins are and returns, because these are private investors, they're affected by private companies, they don't, truthfully, they don't care on the pricing side. They want to look at margins all the time. They look at margins, they look at return on investment. So for wind farms, you're going to get price of metal, um, prices of metals are going to go up because of increased demand because people want to build more and more wind farms or solar panels or whatever. So the actual quantum being um, in demand is going to go up. But these utilities are just saying, well, I still want a, a 7%, 10% return. So irrespective of what's happening with the pricing, they're just going to keep on factoring this 10% return. So prices will go up. And that's why I'm saying that you can... Be, what is the likelihood of these prices of copper or for graphite going up exorbitantly? Graphite, not so much. There's plenty of graphite around. I'll tell you right now that to get up to those kinds of numbers, we bring a few more graphite mines into operation. So, well, where are they? Australia's got a lot. Mozambique's got plenty. They, there's huge capacity. Tanzania has got huge amounts of graphite, which can kick in. So, you're not going to get a price move in any time soon for graphite. Copper's a different story because copper's used more than just for clean energy. It's used right across the board for anything and everything, including combustion engines and transmission, et cetera. We need more copper, but we also have this finite capacity. We can't keep on producing more and more copper, thinking that the price is going to go up for the reasons that I mentioned, um, that you're going to continuously focus on your margins and the returns and your private companies, which we're calling public companies, your listed companies, are not going to be spending hard earned money or um, shareholders equity in taking something that's, that's at risk because, as you all know, your directors will get fired. So, again, it's this chicken and egg. Things will transition. I say paradigm shift, and the reason I use the word paradigm is because that's a stepwise change. We're moving into an environment where we will get a stepwise change in a few of the commodities. You look at some rare earths. We know that uh, China produces or markets and produces around about um, 80, 90, 91% of rare earths as a metal. And in fact, they don't sell metal anymore. And they, they now sell the completed motors, not even magnets. They won't sell magnets. They control it, monopolize the market. So the rest of the world is saying, wow, let's get into this. Well, the chemistry is quite challenging. You've got 17 metals, 15 are lanthanides and the other two, yttrium and, and one of the others. And Australia has said, oh, we'll get to producing metal. Well, what's it going to cost? And right now, because China has it monopolized, they control the pricing. So if, if Australia goes into it, it's going to cost a hell of a lot, firstly in research and then in development and then in operating cost. And the Chinese will always undercut us. So we will never, unless we can get a government subsidy or you know, a, a, some sort of assistance, until we get up that learning curve. And only then could we be competitive. So there's a there's a, a much bigger game at play here that, that neither one of us controls. And we've just got to sit back and say, well, we can do the best forecasting possible, and even then we'll be wrong. Thank you, Eric. Thank you.